Guys, welcome back to Coliseum Forum. Today, I am joined by Steve Scross. You may know him from his work at Marvel. You may know him because of the awesome uh, image book that I'm a big fan of, Maestro's, or his upcoming project, which is actually, I think I might like a little bit more than Maestro's. Still really cool, post-Americana. Steve, how are you doing today? Very well, thank you. Yourself? I am... Nobody, nobody ever asked the host that. I'm doing great, man. I get to talk really? to Steve Scross. That's that's awesome. Thank you for asking. Well, this industry is full of narcissists. That that is, and that I, is correct. I'm going to name them in this interview. <laughs> Every, you're just calling them out, everybody. Do you have a list? They come to me. Yeah. <laughs> Alphabetical. <laughs> start, start with the A's. <laughs> now I'm trying to think like any comic creator with an A, like who would get called out? Uh, anyways, mm, so, Kari Andrews. Who? No, <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. He's a right. nice guy, a friend of mine. So, so let's just jump right into this. So, Post Americana, it's your new book. It's coming out from Image. Um, I have read it. It is fantastic. Um, oh, thanks. Like literally. Okay, so I'm not going to spoil anything, but my reaction spoil. to it was yeah. was spoil. literally with no context. Did she just rip that guy's eyeball out? And um. So just kind of give you an idea of what, what we're looking forward to in this, when this book comes out. So, well, listen, I would never do that. It, she punches his, his eyeball out. Oh, right. Right. Yeah. Right. It, it is. Knocks, definitely a, it was dangling there. And then he, she knocks it right off with a solid that, left that, hook. That is how that happened. Indeed. So tonally, I mean, this feels a little bit different than, than books you've done in the past. I mean, it's different than Maestro's. It's different than obviously your Marvel work. It's different. I mean, where where does this book start? Where's the genesis of Post Americana? I think it goes back to like, you know, I grew up a child in the 80s and the end times were always kind of, you know, looming, uh, yeah, looming. And um, growing up watching, you know, you had the Road Warrior on VHS that I was way too little to watch that I would kind of sneak and watch, uh, you know, behind the couch when my sister and her other teenage friends were watching videotapes and stuff. And um, so it's like that. It's Damnation Alley. It's pretty much the, my sort of apocalyptic media diet that I got when I was a kid. Sort of informs most of post-Americana. Yeah, so definitely the George Miller stuff and, um, um, you know, the contemporary stuff too, like The Road to some degree. Um, I do like a, a bit of... You know, even Star Wars actually plays a big role in in kind of the aesthetic, uh, a bit of the approach I, I took to it. Um, so yes, yeah, so it's a it's a big soup of a lot of things. But, so so we see like Mad, but, Ma Mad Max and um, wow, what was the second thing you said? Uh, Star Wars. I mean, there there's all well, it's Mad Max, it's Star Wars, it's Damnation Alley. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. If you've ever seen that old Jed George Papard movie, it's kind of all these things from the the 70s and 80s that uh, the stand you know of this book yeah. called the, this novel i read when i was young called swan song there's a, a lot of little elements in the soup um i'm trying to think of um you know and also conan uh, was a big part of it i like this idea and this this depiction of america it's kind of a you know everyone's dead there something uh, a few events caused sort of a, a near zero uh you know brought the human po uh, population down to uh, you know zero percent or 0 0.1 percent so it's this kind of futuristic ruin of america where like you know that's sparsely populated and it feels almost like a, you know kind of a mythical land like you would see in conan or something when he's you know riding horseback across you know from uh, aquilonia to you know you know some wizard's castle or something right. you know what i mean there's, yeah. there's a lot of space in between uh, here and there and there's a lot of you know ruins in that space especially in this you know once kind of futuristic blade runner your kind of um cyber cyberpunk mega city you know fall into ruin sure. that this futuristic america you know looks like that's my version anyway so we've kind of teased it a little bit like oh here's what kind of influenced the book so so what is what is post america about and like what's our elevator pitch for this book um so basically what happens is um you know there's this mountain installation uh mountain uh installation in Colorado uh, called the, the the bubble and it's the most sophisticated super bunker in the world you know super futuristic uh, sophisticated so it's you know it's a city built inside a hollowed uh, out mountain meant to house half a million people and it's you know kind of like the last gated community on earth it's a, a modern uh, library of Alexandria where 
every single um, technological advancement of, of this future world has been saved and recorded in case the end ever comes. And it's, and it's basically also set up to be the staging area for the next age of man. Uh, and all the heads of the American government are, are supposed to like, don't show up. They, they don't catch the bus, whatever happens. Uh, they don't wind up there and who shows up are all the court sort of uh, um, oligarchs that have bought a golden ticket on this thing uh, show up instead. And they just kind of hang out there rather than re uh, use the place for its intended purpose. Um, and they just kind of hang out there for generations and like 80 so or so years passes, you know, and then one of them, one of the bubble board wants to go out and explore America and when he, uh, to see the country that his, his parents had always talked about when he returns, it's changed him. And he has, he's sort of become a psychopath and he decides that what he really needs to do is they need to, you know, um, pave over it all. So the shining city on the hill can be rebuilt. And uh, what happens is he runs afoul of this wasteland girl called Carolyn who, her family and her people were a victim of uh, an early campaign of this uh, evil president. And now she's going to grind an ax right in his head. <laughs> so like, correct me if I'm wrong, but so sort of a Jack Kerouac type character who lives in a post Holocaust dystopia that falls into fascism. Uh. Well, it's basically what it is, is you've got this mountain bunker where, right. you know, the one percenters have been basically chilling. And now finally, a Svengali has come in and, you know, got them motivated to kind of go out and rebuild America, right. even though this America is long dead. And what's grown up in this place are these, you know, basically a combination of roving gangs and peaceful communities. Right. And uh, rather than putting a stop to it, they're just going to basically extract people with potential and talent for their resources and destroy everything else. And, uh, there's a wasteland girl that they run into. Right. Who, uh, is going to, you know, that they have to, they have to fight. There's a, there's a bit more plot than that. You know, there's a, a resistance in within the mountain base that's, uh, that the, the wasteland girl, Carolyn runs into this guy, Mike, who was a part of the technical uh, staff at the, at the mountain base and, uh, at the bubble, they call it. And so he is going to, um, uh, you know, kind of, he's on his own mission and they're going to wind up teaming up um, for a few things. Crazy things happen to them. They were right. going to meet, you know, this gang of cannibals called the followers of the path. I was going to say like uh, skin suit, safari outfit wearing cannibals. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and they, they sort of, they're feeling, it's not so much this world isn't a world of like uh, scarcity uh, or sickness, like a lot of post-apocalyptic uh, nuclear fiction. Right. It's more of a world of, um, you know, uh, lost knowledge, but it's it's all laying around uh, in front of you. And these cannibals have decided that mass humanity is the only real evil. And, uh, you know, basically they, they drink this psychotropic goo and uh, they get wrecked on that. And that keeps their crazy train rolling. And, uh, you know, whatever crosses they path, their path, they feed on it. And, uh, yeah, so they, they play a role, and a lot of other crazy stuff happens, too. So let, let's kind of shift gears and rewind a little bit for, for before Post Americana, because this is not your first foray. I mean, you are, I mean, hyper-talented, first of all. And second of all, you've done some really, really cool stuff. Um, I mean, you've worked at Marvel. I'm a huge X-Men fan. I mean, you've worked on Cable and, and some other of the X-Books. Um, but even before that, and I don't know if a lot of people are – are aware of this and if they are it's still something i really want to talk about because it's the coolest thing ever you were the storyboard artist on the matrix i was for the whole trilogy and the new one as well um that yeah is... that was a very lucky thing that happened to me when i was young how... uh, starting out so can we i mean can we hear that story like how does that happen sure i get hired at marvel it was the boom time they would hire just about anybody with a pencil uh, clive barker had this line of books called the razor line and he had four premises that he kind of concepts that he came up with that were written by other uh, writers and the you know basically the unproven young wachowskis were the writers on this book i i got uh, paired off with them on this book called ecto kid and then we sort of struck up a friendship and that kind of led them to when they went to Hollywood. They tried to get me to work on their first film called Bound, and I uh, didn't want to leave the rock-solid world of comics for <laughs> right. the flash-and-pan 
world of uh, movie movie making. But then they talked me into the second movie, uh, The Matrix, and uh, I worked for that kind of for close to a year, over a couple years. I would come out for a couple months, go home, and then come back. And they were using the artwork to kind of sell as a pitch to Warner Brothers to get them to finance the production. And uh, it was funny, the whole time I worked on it, it was never green lit. It, after I had been done with it for a year, it, you know, every time I finished it, it seemed like it was never going to happen. And then finally, uh, I did. And so it became what it was. So, yeah. How far into the, like, I mean, how far had you storyboarded into to the actual movie that, like, what they, what, they, what they were kind of pitching when they went around? Like, did you have, like, a complete storyboard set? or? Well, what they did is, what they had to do is they had to, at that time, I think it was Terry Simmel, a bunch of old guys were running Warner Brothers. You know right. what I mean? And this is kind of cutting edge cyberpunk, you know, fiction that they're yeah. dealing with. And a lot of it, they just didn't understand. So they needed a book that they could kind of, a lot, they created a coffee table book that they could flip through that would have big moments in the movie. Right. And like a key, and each scene would have like a black card with like a key line of dialogue uh, from the movie. And so that's what we worked on is we would do these kind of big kind of comic booky illustration storyboards that were, you know, maybe less for the production and more for the, for these guys to be wowed right, right. so they would go oh wow this is this is cool they know what they're doing they have an aesthetic for this thing it's different and uh, yeah and i think it worked i think they were impressed by their presentation i mean obviously... and then they got keanu that was the other thing keanu well, so, was interested so this was this is actually a personal question for me i was going to ask before we did because it's one of my favorite movies i think any most guys my age will be like yeah make sure one of my favorites sure um when when they pitched this idea, you you know you passed on bound. They were like, okay, we're gonna do this really cool cyberpunk movie um, called The Matrix. Uh, here's here's the kind of concept. Uh, did you did they already kind of have a an idea in mind of what the, that character like they, the 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 goth bondage kind of thing, or they were like, hey, go go wild, design what you want for these characters. Oh no, they had they had everything figured out figured out, and if I brought anything to it, it was the fact that I would I followed their direction closely. I mean, I was like 22 or something, and uh, you know, <laughs> it's funny that they they even hired. They just you know knew I was being dumb and decided to help me and hired me for Matrix anyway. And uh, yeah, it, it was pretty. It was pretty great. It was really an earn while you learn uh, program I was uh, involved in. So, but, um, so, so Matrix happens. Um, it becomes this like phenomenon right like it just it mm -hmm. blew up it was crazy i mean that was, literally yeah. we, we got a dvd player that the year came out on dvd and it was the first dvd you owned and me and my brother probably watched it four trillion times um <laughs> yeah. so then obviously there's sequels and then uh so that they're, they're like hey you're really good at this come back and, and storyboard these sequels yeah yeah that was wild too it was like that golden era right before the internet had hadn't like you know taken away all the revenue from the DVD and everything. And there were still video stores and, uh, you know, it was just like the streets were paved with gold back, back then. And, uh, yeah, it was an exciting time to be rolling in on the, uh, matrix sequels. And, uh, yeah, it was an amazing life experience. Got to travel the world and uh, meet a lot of cool artists and all that stuff. And spent a few, probably close to a decade doing movie stuff. And, uh, now I'm being, was pulled back to comics you know, which really was my, my first love. So, well, that, that was actually my next question. So, um, I mean, there's a career to just be had doing storyboarding stuff, right. Or work, you know, doing that kind of development on, on film and TV, but here you are, you come back and you do, you do maestros. Uh, now we have post Americana. Like what brought you back to comics? Well, I was always just a comic book guy. I mean, the, I sort of fell into this, the movie stuff and it's exciting or whatever, but you get a little older and, um, it's, um, it's really great the opportunity to make create your own world and your own story and as i got older i realized how you know precious an opportunity like that is and it's great that images uh, been helping me do that and um it was just something i wanted to do that in my heart you know as uh, always being a cartoonist it was like yeah i gotta create my own stories and, and work on those things and uh, maybe hopefully that will you know be better than just going job after job i mean movies are a great job but it's hard to um you know, once you do the Matrix, I mean, not every movie is the Matrix. Right. You know, sometimes you're you're working on Cats and Dogs, two, the quickening. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. And you're like, right. oh, fuck. You know, and you're like, yeah. Eh. yeah. So <laughs> you know well, what I mean? Yeah. No. So let me ask you this: like, 
after the matrix like what, what else did you work on in, in in terms of that kind of process well i worked on a lot of movies uh, i worked on uh, a lot of movies i worked during that time didn't get made i worked on i robots a couple small horror things in town the other thing i worked on for a long time was george miller's justice league uh film that never got made which would have been awesome and yeah and it was it was very wild because i was a huge fan of his obviously right and I got to go to Australia, which was a place I had a lot of people I knew. So it was just it's just an amazing place to go to and work on those characters that I hadn't worked on uh, for so long. And um, basically just drawing these amazing fights with Batman, Superman and Wonder Woman and all the heroes. And uh, yeah, ultimately, there was some wild budget uh, to make it happen. But yeah. I don't know who was the fans Justice League either. Right. But... It had some fun stuff in it. It had some nutty stuff. The guy who just passed away, Immortum Joe, remember yeah, that guy? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, he was going to be Martian Manhunter. Really? And they had made, yeah, they had made like this, uh, Weta had made this like super slick um, maquette of the Marge Martian Manhunter. And you're like, that's the perfect Martian. He was all extra slender and sleek with these kind of cool kind of joints at the elbows that were a little alien. And uh, he just looked cool. But then they hired that guy who was kind of an older, heavier set guy. And, uh, you know, they put him in like foam rubber and stuff. And he kind of looked like a green thing. You know, like the thing had, the thing had gotten, you know, his tummy was upset or something. But, uh, so it was, I, mean, um, I, I mean, obviously we're a little bit off, off track here. Um, cause I want to talk yeah. about you. This is about you and how awesome you are. But I got to ask, um, were, I mean, were they going to do practical effects on that movie? Was that the idea? Like practical versus well, like it would have been. I'm sure there would have been a combination, but it most mostly would have been CG. Well, for an actor in a suit, I think he would have been a practical okay. character. They were they were going for that. They were trying a lot of different stuff with the costumes, uh, which was crazy because they were doing the new Fifty Two at the same time, and so we're having all these conversations about you know right. what can you leave on the suit and what can't you leave, like. What do you? It was funny because we just because they decided you couldn't put a collar on Superman, and you know, well, and why? that's what they did at DC. Huh? Why, why can't we put a collar on Superman? Well, they they decided that the that the mantle could had to be unchanged. That was Superman. The oh, okay. mantle. Okay. Like you can do anything everywhere else, but that part has to be the same. Um, and I think they've done that in the movies mostly. Kept I, that part the same. Yeah. I didn't they do it in, in Rebirth? He had it, it comes up, doesn't it? Oh, does he? I don't yeah, know. I think so. And he's got the the longer sleeves. Um, <laughs> anyways, if you're just tuning in, we're with Steve Scrooge, <laughs> uh, the creator of uh of Post Americana. Um, and we were just talking about the fact that he was the storyboard artist on the matrix and, and worked on some other films, um, and, and TV shows. Um, we did have a question. Somebody asked, is that a full scale agent Smith sitting behind you? It is. Yes. Let's see here. This is. Wait, does he have a gun belt on too? <laughs> well, he wears like, uh, yeah, he's got a gun belt and he's got like a hat on and he sort of keeps me company. I mean, how often, and, uh, how often do you guys talk? Like, how well does he know you? He's seen everything. <laughs> no, we are don't. Uh, I understand that's just a manic. So. Fair, fair enough. Um, so, um, and, I, and I do want to ask, uh, so you, you worked on, on Matrix 4 as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so you know the whole story, basically, because you drew it out? I'm guessing I've read, I've read the script and uh, yeah, no, it's wild. I mean, uh, people are not going to expect the cat people in that and just the animal, human animal hybrids in general, I think will blow people away. <laughs> right. Right. No, I mean, that <laughs> feels kidding. like a very natural evolution from the story where we left. It's off. funny. Someone asked me about that and I had to, I wrote in some uh, written interview and just, I wrote just kind of a bunch of hot air, just kind of like, it's the best this and that. And, people will be excited for this and you know, it's just, but I didn't say anything. <laughs> right. Right. You know, so, so now we're back. very good. It, it, you said it's going to be very good. Yes. There you go, Paul. So, so my producer is a huge matrix fan. So I like, I had to get ah, some, cool. something for him. Um, of course. I, me personally am excited for post Americana. I mean, we kind of went over what the, the book's about, but you know, one of the thing I th things I think makes you uni unique in the industry is, um, you know, it really feels like you're either an artist or a writer, and very few times do you see people do both. And then very few times, if they do do both, do they do it well, right? Because, mm. I mean, it's kind of demanding. You know, being a writer could be a full-time job. Being an artist is 
definitely a full-time job that i mean that i don't know how you guys do it um and then the, the idea that you're going to take the strain of both of those those jobs those full-time jobs onto yourself and, and create like i mean honestly I'm assuming your vision right um you know what's that like when you put it like that you're right it's insurmountable <laughs> right failure is inevitable right. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, like I said before, you know, at this point in my life, it's probably why it took so long to do it because I was, um, you know, I always thought, oh, I'll get to, I did some Marvel comics. I wrote a Drew and Wolverine story and then I didn't really do anything until Maestro's and, uh, on my own, I had a little notebook full of ideas that, uh, are really what I'm doing now. But, um, yeah, it took a while. And then finally, you know, you get to a point where, uh, you know, you know, get older and you're like, well, you know, I better do this or I won't do it at all. And that becomes the more scary thing than worrying about the workload or anything else. You know, I'm just sort of, you know, ex excited. I'm never happier than when I've been productive at the drawing table and got those uh, pages done or if it's a scene that I like, you know, so, which is scary because, you know, uh, what do I do if I don't like any, like it anymore? Does that, has that happened? But, Have you dealt with that? Oh, definitely. Oh, definitely. It's been a roller coaster for sure. But uh, there have been stuff where I haven't been happy or I couldn't solve it. And, you know, I went back. It took me a very long time to resolve something. Um, but um, overall, I like what I've, I like where the book is now that I, I put it out. I think it's the best thing I've done anyway so I, far. Yeah. I, I mean, I'm a big fan of Maestro's. So I but reading that first Thanks. issue, like this is the this is the problem of getting to read stuff early. It's like a peek at your Christmas presents. And so it's now. Um, and if, if you're just tuning in, we're talking to Steve Scross about Post Americana. Um, it is in co your local comic book shop uh, as of December 13th, which is what two Wednesdays from now, right? I'm bad at time. Is it next? Something Wednesday? like that. Yes. Yeah. Next Wednesday. Yeah. yeah. So December 13th. Um, obviously. Lucky 13. Lucky 13. Uh, Coliseum is going to have it in stock. Obviously, we're very excited about that book. That's why we're talking with you. Awesome. Um, awesome. But, I, I kind of want to dig into your process a little bit because a lot of times on these Coliseum forums, we're talking to the writer and or the artist for a book. And, you know, we kind of go over their process like, oh, well, as an artist, I start with like, you know, I kind of storyboard it. And if a, a writer he's like, oh, I script it. And, you know, when we're talking to the writers, you know, they've talked about, um, you know, getting stuck on things and having to go back and, and kind of like you did. But I mean, again, going back to that, you're taking on that double duty. Um, you know, what is your process like? Do you start with scripting? Like, do you write out the script first or how do we, how do we tackle that? Yeah, it's a combination. I sit down with the sketchbook. Sometimes it'll be my iPhone and I'll just write. Sometimes it'll be a shot list. Like it'll be a note about an image and then maybe a piece of dialogue and uh, just kind of listing things uh, kind of helps. And so I'll do a lot of that. And then I'll, you know, and then I'll start add taking some of those notes and doing drawings with them and more dialogue. And then you kind of get an idea of a scene and who's in it. And you just, you just keep building. I can show you like, you know, here's a workbook of mine. You know, this is kind of what it looks like. Right. Right. Okay. It's so, so it's notes and notes. And it's kind of like crazy. Like, you know, like the chick from um, Homeland, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, where's I got to I get some string in here, right? Right. Connect things. The camera but turns, like, and you just got like yeah. a big billboard with like yarn and yeah. Yes. So it's a lot of revising and like, yeah. Sometimes I'll forget where stuff is, but uh, that's generally the way I, I'll do it. I'll just keep working on that, and then I, you know, well, once it feels, you know, ready, then I move over and I do it draw digitally. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so um. So, so you kind of loosely plot it with, with like your crazy conspiracy notebook. And then, um, from there, um, I mean, you, you don't really actually flesh out like a full, it's not like a Brian Michael Bendis situation where it's like, here's a, here's a script for you. Like, it's just, you have the kind of, these right. Cause those are, well, those, they do that because those are like documents for the artist, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they're, they're the instructions to build it. So no, I don't do it as much, but yeah, I'll make like notes about it, but it's much messier and not really decipherable by anyone but me and even not by me sometimes see and that was the part that i was curious about right because it you know when, when you're in these partnerships with your artists and things like that um you know you kind of have to like explain it in a way that they understand it and kind of capture your vision so they can draw it that way but when it's you you're it's, it's like you it's, it's it's the steve show right so well that kind of helps with the productivity so i don't have to 
like maybe I'm starting an issue and I don't have the exact last five panels of the of the story in that issue totally figured out. I know what's going to happen. You know, I've got some drawings. You know, I basically have an idea of the scene. But as I'm drawing pages, you know, I'm making notes and thinking about what's coming up as well. And then hopefully I can, as I get to the further down the line, there's like more and more thought has been put into everything as I as I get to it. And then uh, hopefully it's something that that I want by the time I'm, I get there at the end. Um, yeah. Yeah. So usually that works. And the more, more, the longer I'm on it as I'm, you know, in the fifth one now, it feels like, uh, you, you know, where it's going to land. So oh, I'm a little more confident. I, I love, and also hate when like, who I have a question queued up and I'm like, I'm asking this one next. And then the guy's like, or the, the, the people, the person I'm interviewing is like, here's the answer to that question that you, you didn't even know I was going to ask. Um, so, so you're, <laughs> you're, you're already on in, in, in issue five. Yes. So f- one through four, they're in a can, in the can. Oh yeah, abs- absolutely. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, there's just some lettering going on and stuff. Sure. But yeah, my part of it is all uh, uh, completed. So, yeah. And you got Dave Stewart. He's coloring this book for you. Oh yeah, Dave. Yeah, let oh, me yeah. talk about the collaborators. Dave is, just brings so much life and depth uh, and and tone to the uh, you know the story. Uh, I just love it. I feel so lucky that he uh, colors my books and uh, yeah, he just killed it on this one. Yeah. And uh, phonographics over there, uh, Stephen Finch does, uh, yeah, amazing logo and amazing, you know, fonts and graphic design all throughout. Um, yeah, he's a genius. They both are. <laughs> well, th- that was going to be my next question. Like, how do you, and Dave Stewart, get connected and, and start working together? Well, Dave, I'm friends with Jeff Darrow, and Dave colors Darrow stuff, and Jeff just put in a good word for me, and uh, I was able to trick him into doing. <laughs> And, uh, I guess he didn't hate it because uh, he's like the one of the best, or I think he's the best colorist yeah. in the industry. And he's got he's got so many Eisners. He could he could uh, you know he could make himself like an outdoor pizza oven bricked with Eisner awards. You know, correct me if I'm wrong. There's you just could... so many of them. You you've been nominated before though. I mean, you guys are always a, always a bridesmaid, Billy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that's still always the show. Made. You know how many Eisners I've been nominated for? But this listen, many. How many? Zero. I've been nominated oh, for zero well, Eisner awards. I think that's bull. I mean, so you guys don't get retailer awards. You should have won that for sure. So I think the and, and, and correct me if Eisner. I'm wrong, uh, Paul. You've done this a little bit longer than I have. We have to like self submit ourselves. Like we have to say like. Hey, yeah, we're Kyle Sim. We're awesome. Oh. And then they're like, "Yeah, those guys are awesome." Here's your Eisner. And right. It's just like, eh, not. I mean, not to brag, but like, we know what we are. You know. So maybe if they want to to come out and recognize. I us, see what you mean. I yeah. get it. I yeah. get you. We're we're a pretty princess. You don't. Like, you, uh, the you, process you... doesn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Well, you should. Uh, I'll make my own award. You guys can. I'll get a. I'll make a scrosi for you guys. I'll take uh, best listen, retailers. I would value a scrosi. Sure more than any other award I've ever received. Um, I am the only uh, recipient of the Coliseum of Comics Rookie of the Year Award. Um, and, but I would I would put that oh, wow. higher Whoa. on the shelf. I would put a Scrosi much higher on the shelf. I, would, I yeah. regret saying Scrosi now, actually. Well, <laughs> <laughs> but... Uh... No, that's a good award name. But that's, it's, that's it's okay. You, you, guys, you guys deserve it. I mean... But... Um... Have you? Like, I gotta ask. Have what you ever actually? Again? Ha, have you ever made it to to Florida? No, uh, I think I did once, but I didn't really. Years ago, they had these things called the Marvel Mega Tours. Yeah. Uh, like, God, you probably won't even. I mean, it was it was like the boom, and they were trying to do their own conventions, and so they would send us to those things. And I feel like one of them was in Florida. I feel like maybe the first one I went to, or maybe it was, I think it was Texas. Anyway, I didn't remember. Um, but usually I go to those things. And I would just hang out at the hotel. I was like 19 years old and didn't know anything. <laughs> Still so don't. How, I mean, how long, I mean, you've been in the industry for, for quite a while, right? Since I was 18. Yeah. I was going to say like 20 something years at this point. There were, God, is it maybe more than that? I'm 47. Started when you were 18. Uh, so that would mean carry the one. And, uh, how many years is that? I think it's, uh, we'll see. Two and 
29 years. Sorry, my producer's doing <laughs> fingers at me and it's just confusing me. Yeah, 29 years. So yeah, so yeah, almost three decades, give or take. Oh. Also, doing math during any kind of interview is yeah. That's like that's like gold, that should be like way. review broadcast 101. gold. Like don't don't do math during like yeah. That's terrible. Like you, my, I'm gonna tell my producer this. We need a calculator. So when this situation arises again, you just do the math for us, please. Um, so no, yeah, 29 years. I have an answer. abacus just out of frame here, but I'm I won't grab it. <laughs> See, that would have made this so easy. You could have just been like two, ten. Yeah. There it is. 29 years. We have confirmed off camera. 29 years you've worked in the industry um doing some of the coolest comics ever i mean like you said you drew the wolverine book um also it was weird that you mentioned that that clive barker um line of comics because that's like a really deep cup mm -hmm. um we weirdly there's like an audience for those um that exists not weirdly i mean it's clive barker it's horror comics um mm -hmm. so it makes sense but they they don't exist in large volumes now um and I've never actually seen bet, one yeah. in person, but it's like we I've had customers come in and ask for these like in just like the last couple hmm. of years. Um, so it's interesting. One that you worked on it with the Wachowskis. Um, I am sure speculators right now are searching every 50 cent bin on Earth for these to get them up on eBay. Um, and two, um, I mean, that's an interesting kind of place to start. Like how like, how do you I mean, I know at that point you're at Marvel, but how did you get cooked up with with that project? Well, it was one of these things, you know, I was a kid and in those days, you know, internet, you would drive to San Diego. I drove to San Diego on my Yugo with my little Xeroxed packages of my the comic samples. And I just would, you'd hand them out to editors who were on the floor of the San Diego. And I handed mine to this one guy who was an editor uh, uh, and he was, became the editor of this Clyde Barker thing. And uh, the artist that he had quit and he pulled out the packet and called me up. And we're like, there you go. I'm going to bring this book in under budget. <laughs> is, that, is that how that happened? We're going to get the... Well, I, don't know, I don't know what you say, but probably. How well, hilarious. This oh, this this is funny. Is I remember you get your first batch, like the most like, you know, kind of historic moment in my life was getting my batch of Marvel paper from Marvel for the first time because it was this coveted paper that you'd sort of... I remember they had the crappier kind of blue line you could buy at the comic book store but i mean real marvel paper right you know i'd seen it on, and so i finally got my marvel paper but it had gotten wet and so it had would had buckled and right. so i had to draw on it anyway and i asked for more paper and they wouldn't send it to me so he told me to put weight on it so i had to go get these big cinder blocks and so my first issue of Ecto kid was drawn on this warped damp marvel paper that was like sort of pressed flat by like 300 pounds of weight anyway so and that's another thing to talk about and then like i don't want to like stick on the 29 number but how like what how did did you guys just mail like your art back and forth like how did that work it was fedex yeah so it... i would send fedex it to the um uh to the inker right and then uh, i think they still did they use at least for some period i was there when they were still doing dye or no wait a minute no they were doing the separations and they would have a, a separate artist sort of color on xeroxes with um you know colored pens um and then the separator guys in Ireland, I think they were, would try to recreate that. And so there was a whole period of some very weird colors there. Yeah, I can see that. Marvel. For sure. You know, it was a weird scene. Um, but, uh, man, this is. This but it's a good, good times. Anyway, they were crazy. They even had like a big, con um, you know, we had a. Clyde Barker came down to San Diego and we had a big, uh, uh, you know, meeting to discuss our huge crossover event of the yep. Barkerverse books. You're right. And uh, it was pretty wild. That we got, so I got to spend a little time with him, uh, but then you know we got home and they a week later the whole thing collapsed and they canceled them all. So, but I I like I gotta be honest like I'm a little bit in all of you just because you know you lived like one of the coolest lives ever right like yeah so when I was like in my early twenties <laughs> I I got some work at Marvel um, working on these books with Clive Barker and the Wachowskis and then. Um, yeah, I hung out with them and that was really cool. And, you know, I did some really other, some cool comic stuff. Like, like you mentioned, Wolverine, Cable, some of that stuff. And then I did uh, some storyboarding at, at the, uh, on, on the Matrix. You might've heard of that movie. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of a, you know, an indie classic, but not really widely known. Um, then I did, uh, I started doing uh, creator own stuff. Uh, a few years ago, I did a book called Maestros, which is uh, this weird, fun, like fantasy kind of inspired book. Oh, and now I'm back with, uh, 
an even cooler book. I, I love dystopia, so I, I'm super stoked on this post America. Yeah, me too. I agree. Um, it's it, that's like if it, it it could be the worst B list movie or the worst comic book on earth. That this, if, as soon as they're like, it's a dystopia, I'm like, I'm in, I'm sold. But something, Steve, yeah, Steve Scrolls doing a dystopian sci fi, like kind of like, uh, I don't know if I'd go so far as to say like a um. Uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Like, like, like a uh, a review of uh, like American culture is like you know that might be too broad, but like, I mean, it, it has all the pieces to like make me a happy fan, and I mean, the, I I can't be more excited about this book. Oh, great! I mean, it's a lot of it is you know it's my spin on some of the the classic tropes, and I I hope there's a couple things around three and four, some new ideas or that are going to seem fresh. You're going to meet a character called night terror, who is known as a pop culture superhero from yeah. the, uh, the gone world. And uh, he has sort of an interesting twist to his past. And when we meet him, he sort of takes us to this whole other world of weird stuff that I think, uh, you know, sort of spins the book a little bit. Uh, it gets a little weirder, what? but, uh, and it's also kind of, we're aiming for like, it's going to be more of an uplifting ending than, you know, just like, a brooding you know uh you know quagmire of depravity and despair <laughs> like the road or something right, right, right. this is this is heroic action and adventure you know uh you know it's high adventure and and um so yeah so there'll be some you know we've got some horrible things in it too but uh they're all pretty fun horrible well, well earlier on you'd mentioned cormac mccarthy and i was just like Oh no. Okay, I see where this is going. So I'm really glad you made a point to say like, yeah, okay, maybe it's not as dark as Cormac McCarthy. So that that's good. Oh no, like there's there's humor in it. I mean, it's uh for sure. It definitely has uh has some humor. It's more like an adventure, you know, like yeah. you know, I guess Star Wars is a good jumping off point. I mean, it, those movies feel the like R-rated version of that. Yeah, yeah, let, let, let's definitely classify that with the uh, NC-17 maybe. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not dirty. There's no like sex stuff but it is just kind of violent and action action packed more kind of grindhousey than uh than sure. anything but it's not really uh there's no really there's no tna or that, that sort of thing right right um so just badassery the, i mean issue one's already packed with that um you mentioned night terror i mean he does make his cameo first appearance um for all the speculators out there in post america Arcana number one um and i was really hoping we would see some more of that stuff because if in the first issue it does feel like you seed a lot of stuff and i'm like Oh, I hope we get a payoff on this. I hope there's a payoff on this. Um, so, I mean, you kind of gave me what I wanted there. Like, it's like, yeah, okay. it's a big, it's a, yeah, it's all, it's all payoff. All those characters that I set up pretty much. Yeah. It's all Easter eggs. Pretty much. Uh, there's a bunch of frames that are just crammed with, with stuff that's going to pop up later on in, in a fun way that uh, no one, I think we'll see coming that um, I don't know. It's pretty, it's pretty weird and fun. I liked making this one a lot. So hopefully people dig it. So, Okay. Let me ask you this because obviously I like I love selling comics. It's literally my like I love selling the stuff that you guys do. It's my dream job. If I'm a fan of X, I would really like Post Americana. Hmm. Well, well, you know, like I said, if you like post apocalyptic fiction, if you like, I mean, it's not like The Walking Dead, but there's a certain kind of like edgy violence where you don't know what's going to happen next and what. You know who it's going to happen to. I think you know Post Americana has that, and you know the sci-fi vibe. I, I think seeing a uh, there's something appealing about you know wandering, you know, a collapsed America and ruin. You know, there's something uh, kind of taking that idea and, and, and bringing a bit of sci-fi fantasy to that is super appealing. I mean, you know, I would say Thundar and uh, Commandi and Road Warrior. I mean, there's so many little flavors that are like wound into this thing. And, uh, and it's also gets a little weird blade runner later on. There's you'll, you'll see kind of a blade runner vibe running through it too. That uh, I think when they, you put all these pieces together, I don't know it feels like. So kind of like a hobo fresh, stew yeah. of, of all the coolest stuff that's ever happened. Yeah. I'm trying. Yeah. Trying to, that's what I'm getting at. Okay, uh, yeah. That works. You really I mean, want to buy this. No, you, I mean, <laughs> but you, yeah. I, and it's double that. size too. The first issue is 32 pages of story. Uh, for the same old price of three hundred ninety nine cents. So is it, is, oh yeah, I guess that is three hundred ninety nine cents. That's weird. That yeah. I've never used that. I'm gonna take that. That's that's mine now. I'm gonna. That's Jeff, Jeff Darrow puts that on his comics, and it's 
pretty good. Just just swiping from him again, you know. Yeah, that's fine. All right, so we're gonna do something different to 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 kind of wrap up our Coliseum Forum today. We're gonna do a, a Coliseum Forum lightning round. That's something we kind of toyed around Whoa. with. Yeah. So basically, I've got a list of questions for you. I'm gonna ask you okay. these questions. Don't put too much thought into them. Just spit out the first thing that comes to mind. All right. And they're they're not they're not deep thinkers. I promise. Not deep cuts here. All right. So favorite movie. This better not get me canceled. No, 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 none of that. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> favorite movie. Okay. Okay. Favorite movie. Um, hmm. Probably Road Warrior. Good answer. Uh, favorite color. Um, I don't know. Black. It's not a color, is it? Sure, it is. <laughs> favorite comic book. Hmm. You... <sighs> Problem with I have trouble with favorites because it's, it depends on when I am. But you know the usual suspects from when I was a uh, favorite comic book. Damn. Hmm. Um, as a child, we'll, we'll have the in parentheses as a child. Frank Miller's Dark Knight Returns. I loved it. That's a, it was that, a big deal when I read it. I mean, that, that was a big deal. Um, Sorry, some more. It's still kind of a kind of a big deal. All right. Um, what was the next one? Favorite superhero. Hmm. I'm going to give the, I like Batman, but I think I like Wolverine better. Batman is an aging as well for me as much as I like Wolverine, you know? Yeah. I'm kind of in that same boat. I mean, there's been some, uh, some, kind so of... much heart to Wolverine and that Logan yeah. movie was so good. Agreed. I still think that's the best of them. And, uh, I don't know. I just like the depiction of him. He just had, it was just less of a fantasy and, um, I don't know, kind of a more of a, a meditation on that kind of the idea of heroism and uh, there's emptiness there, you know? No, fair enough. Uh, favorite comics artist that is not Steve Scross. Oh, geez. There's so many comic artists I like. Who do I like a lot now? Like, God. They just go on Instagram and there's so many, like, I don't know, top of my head. Who do I see? James Heron. Uh, you know. Obviously, I love Francois Bouc is a French artist that I really love. Uh, Michael Golden um, is is in the DNA. You know, Otomo, Katsuhiro, Darrow, obviously. Um, guys like that are probably the most the most favorites. And then I like, you know, John Byrne. All the stuff I loved as a kid, too. John Byrne, Paul yeah. Smith, the 80s Marvel, Frank Miller, all that stuff. Bill Sienkiewicz. Bill Sienkiewicz, actually, but he was like, when I... Uh, I didn't love him at first when I was a kid. It was too much for me. It was just like, what are you doing? Why are you doing all this scratchy stuff? I like the I had that had the Marvel opposite way. effect of me. The first time I saw that, I was just like, it my brain just inherent like I was like, this is this is I know this is what's cool is supposed to be. So then I made myself like it. And now he's one of my favorites. I love it. Um mm. all right, favorite comics writer huh. that is not Steve Scrolls. Oh, well, Alan Moore, I guess. I should probably think of someone more interesting. Uh, well, Daniel Klaus, I'm going to throw him in there, too, because he's written a lot of comics that I adore and have read over and over again, and he's not the same one as Alan Moore. Everyone says Alan Moore. Uh, yeah, I mean, Alan Moore's a great one, though. I mean, how do you, he's a legend. How do you top that, right? Yeah, I should pick someone, I don't know. Like more esoteric? Like, like deeper cut? Yeah. Yes. Um, like uh, Steve Englehart's uh, Power Man era, but just between 76 <laughs> and uh, the spring of 77, you know. The weird part is there's a guy watching this right now going like, yeah, Steve Scrooge, that's right. Um, all right. Uh, all right. Last question uh, for all the right. evening. Favorite comfort food when you're home on a cold day? Mm. Well, lately we've been doing some pulled pork tacos that are pretty amazing. Yeah, just fucking incredible. Uh, got that Instapot thing going. Another great American invention. I have no idea if America made it. I don't either. I mean, they're very popular here, um, so we'll take credit for it. We're good at that. That's us. We did that. So look, look You're... for my Instapot uh, Easter eggs and post Americana. <laughs> if you haven't tried the air fryer either, that's another big one. That's uh, pretty Ooh, good. Air fryer. Ooh. Yeah, it's like kind of like a. It's really just kind of a fancy convention oven, but they like. Or convection oven and they they branded it air fryer and everybody's like yeah this is healthier but we're still frying our food so it's awesome oh really hmm. yeah i have a convection oven i didn't know it could air fry i like i like the the problem with air fryers that was actually going to be the name of my greater own superhero character but uh, <laughs> now i had to come up with something else right right the air fryer the air what was can i ask what, what was his power well he would fry the air wouldn't he <laughs> 
<laughs> You'd be sitting there breathing, and then the next thing you know, <laughs> this is your a... insides are fried. I don't know if I like this guy. I'm, I'm glad we kind of <laughs> went, went a different direction here. He's a misunderstood hero. Well, I do he's like Shadowhawk. <laughs> you know what's he, weird? He maims you. Darkhawk yeah. is becoming like massively popular again for. I don't know really since, yeah i and, loved you know i liked dark hawk back in the day yeah me too uh, I, I, bought, I would go into the store and bought those things yeah no like his first appearance is <laughs> is going up in value like people are like kind of excited about dark hawk again and i was like is it 1990 what year is this um so well yeah. it's a pretty good simple you know he finds a it's like green light he finds a rock or yep. whatever is in the amulet and becomes yep. super and he's got all the regular problems right so it's like Spider-Man, really but also Green Lantern, but also they, 90s. They should just do one where, like, he gets the powers, but he doesn't have any regular problems. His life is great, so he doesn't want to lose, <laughs> use the powers at all. Right. He's... So it's basically him just skating through life, just using the powers <laughs> super minimal way. Right, right. <laughs> like, he can't reach the remote, so he uses, like, the gym. Yeah, He's... yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or, like, you know, mind controls you, so you, like, give him more, you know, green beans or something at the <laughs> cafeteria. Right, he gets shorter on the tater tots. He's just like, I need more of these. Uh, <laughs> tater tots. So I, I, this is a weird way to end our interview because um, I don't want to take up too much of your time because obviously I would like you to get back to work on this comic because I can't wait to read more of it. Um, but I want to talk about pulled pork tacos with you for a second because I, I got some tips for you if you're ready for this. Oh, this yeah, is, sure. This is, this is one of my favorite foods. Uh, my uncle, when we moved to the south, he got an interest in smoking meats, uh, which is like a big thing here in the south. Um, and, he, and he showed me how to do it. So it's actually one of my favorite kind of hobbies and pastimes is, is to, to smoke meat. So if you have the ability to, and if you have like a Weber mm. kettle grill, there's like conversion mm. tips online, smoke your pork first. That's that's the first step. And then mm. uh, when you do your taco, um, do you do soft shell or hard shell? Soft shell. Okay, well, perfect. I do. we do both, but the, with the pulled pork, we do a traditional. Perfect. With the soft shell, um, cold saw. If you're a coleslaw fan, I, I, coleslaw oh yeah, we do of, that. It's yep. a little controversial, and if you can find it, uh, Carolina mustard barbecue sauce. You put those things together, mm. all in one. It's a medley of flavor, savory, sweet, tangy. Does hits all the right mm, notes. Sounds amazing. You should try it. That sounds really good, so, Billy. I will take that information. I love making delicious treats like that. It's like my other hobby. I love doing is uh, obsessing over cooking of, you know. No, I'm just just an excuse so I can eat a ton of pork. Yeah, no, same for me. In an like, unhealthy way. Yeah, yeah. no, same. <laughs> like and, and like the I find a tortilla, a soft tortilla, perfect mm. vehicle to eat unhealthy amounts of pork. So. Oh yeah, we went right through that thing. <laughs> but. But you know, takes a lot of energy sitting here all day. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> is that is that is that what, how we quantify what we do? Like we we just sit here and draw comics. Well, uh, yeah, draw. You know, it takes a lot. The focus just burns calories up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's like carrying water up a up a hill. <laughs> I don't know about you. I haven't really had a, sh a shave or anything during COVID. Uh, so, like, I'm doing it myself, and I'm noticing I'm kind of missing. Maybe took too much off here and there. Listen, I'm gonna get a little personal here for a second. Do you see this mustache? Like, do you? This is a disappointing... really tiny on my screen. A very it, little it, oh, it, mustache. It, it, it's very little in real life too. It's like john waters but like on a chubby baby i i don't know why i do it but i'm very jealous of what you've got going on so don't worry about it um well this is you know listen you know what you've got is best for you right okay. this is a very mangy beard here and then yeah all splotchy uneven colors you know like that's why i'm a cartoonist you know right fair fair well you're supposed to be eccentric i think it goes with the lifestyle right like you I look, guess you look like you can look off kilter. Like I do do that. I do. Yes, I do do, do that. I try to you know, disheveled as often. Right. Kind people, of my look. People are in town, like, you know, hiding their children from you. Like he's a comic book artist. Give, don't look him in the eyes. Don't engage him. I hate that it's come to that, but uh, a few times. Comic book artists but, are uh, my, my wife, my society. wife helps direct me <laughs> back to the, toward the path. Right. Of light. Right. All right. Well, Steve, you, you're one of the best guests I've had for Coliseum Forum. Uh, thank oh, you so great. much for going to do this. Uh, I cannot wait for Post Americana. Um, I awesome. am literally going to put it in front of every customer that we have. So if you are a Coliseum faithful and you're watching this, please be aware that when you bump into me in one of the stores over the next couple of weeks, I will be talking to you about this book because I am 
tremendously excited for it. It's going to be awesome. Steve, thank you Thanks, so much Billy. for doing this. All right, cool. See ya. Buy that book. Buy that book.